The year is 334 BCE. The Persian Empire is ruled by Darius III and spans most of Asia, dipping into North Africa. With an army seemingly mythical in number, the Achaemenid Empire, founded by Cyrus the Great over 200 years prior, was always a mainstay in the Old World. Within just a few years, it would be over. The cause was this man, Alexander. It was his father, Philip, who put together all the pieces of this invasion. But Alexander himself was always seen as special in his own right. According to Plutarch, when Alexander was young, Philip bought a rather expensive horse, named Bucephalus. Bucephalus seemed quite rowdy, and nobody could tame the beast, so Philip ordered it to be returned. But Alexander stopped his father, claiming that he could ride it. Philip dared him to try, but Alexander noticed what nobody else did. He turned the horse towards the sun, and then easily leapt on. The horse had been afraid of its own shadow, and this led to the unruly behavior. So it was with observation and strategy, that Alexander solved this puzzle, a trait which would complement his more aggressive nature as he grew older. As we mentioned in episode 1 of this chapter, Alexander, as a teenager, was tutored by Aristotle. There, he developed a liking for Homer, and kept a copy of the Iliad with him at all times. He believed he was descended from the great Achilles, the greatest warrior from the epic. At 18, he was given command of the companion cavalry at the decisive Battle of Chaeronea, which won Greece for Philip. But once news spread that Philip had been murdered, many regions began to revolt. After dealing with the northern tribes, he marched south in 335 BCE, towards Thebes, one of the leaders of the revolt, along with Athens. At Thebes, he ordered the noblemen who orchestrated the revolt to come out, but the Thebans hid them. In a rage, Alexander rushed into the city with his army, killing upwards of 6,000, and selling tens of thousands into slavery. The young general made an example out of Thebes, and raised the city to the ground. From Theban hegemony of Greece, to being utterly destroyed off the map, Alexander was surely leaving his mark on history. Seeing this, Athens surrendered immediately. He was then recognized as the head of the League of Corinth by democratic vote, attaining his father's status, and now Greece was truly united once more. Next, Persia. In 334 BCE, Alexander crossed into Asia via the Hellespont. In his command were 5,000 cavalry and anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 infantry. His first stop was the ancient site of Troy. There he dedicated his armor to Athena and garlanded the grave of Achilles, of whom he claimed descent. His bodyguard, Hephaestion, did the same to the grave of Patroclus, hinting at a deeper relationship between the two, just like in the Iliad. The Persians needed a counterplan, but were stretched thin. King Darius remained in Susa, far to the east, hoping his western satraps could deal with the invasion. Under Arsites, one of these governors, and Memnon, a Greek working for the Persians, the Persian army made a stand at the Granicus River, barring Alexander from Asia Minor. Though outnumbered, Alexander didn't use his full army for this battle. The Persian lack of tactics was on full display here, and the Macedonians took advantage, charging forward in a full frontal assault. Alexander wasn't just a superb tactician and skilled fighter, but a brave general. He was always in the first charge, leaving himself vulnerable, but this raised his troops' morale. In no time at all, the Persians retreated, despite suffering minimal losses. This gave Alexander the western half of Anatolia. The first step of his conquest was complete. The Macedonian general then liberated the Ionian cities once again, freeing them from Persian rule. During his trek, he consolidated the rest of Asia Minor. Legends say he stopped at the city of Gordium, capital of Phrygia. There rested an ox cart, dedicated to the most important Phrygian god. The cart was tied up to a post, with a knot so intricate, no one was able to detangle it. 
an oracle had proclaimed that whoever undoes the knot will one day rule all of Asia. Alexander gave it a shot, but his strategic mind couldn't figure out this tangled mess. So he relied on his cleverness. He unsheathed his sword and hacked at the knot, splitting it in one swipe. His reasoning was that the knot was broken, it never really mattered how. Continuing his journey deeper into Persian territory, with the oracle's prophecy still fresh in Alexander's mind, the fall of the largest empire ever went from unlikely to inevitable. During this time, Darius realized the seriousness of the situation, so left Susa and moved west, making Babylon his new headquarters. He amassed a fearsome army, Anywhere from 30 to 80,000 light infantry units, along with 11,000 cavalry, with around 10,000 Greek mercenaries sprinkled in. And as always, his personal guard of the 10,000 immortals. The battle was to be on an open field, and with an army almost twice the size of Alexander's, this would be where the invasion ended. But luck was with the invaders. Alexander had come down with a fever, delaying his invasion for weeks. Sick of simply waiting, Darius marched up to Anatolia to meet Alexander's army there. He circled behind the army and cut off the Greek supply lines, forcing Alexander to backtrack. Alexander and his army caught the Persians camping near the town of Issus, on a very narrow plain between the Gulf of Issus and the mountains. And Darius and Alexander finally met face to face. The battle began with a Persian cavalry charge, but the narrow battlefield negated the Persians' superior numbers. The Macedonian left flank could handle the onslaught, while Alexander attacked from the right, smashing through to attack Darius directly. With his life in danger, the Persian king retreated, leaving most of his army behind, including his wife, daughters, and mother. The casualties ended up being massive for the Persians, with the dead numbering from 20 to 40,000. Alexander did treat the king's family well though, and later in his life, went on to marry one of Darius's daughters, Statera. The Battle of Issus was a turning point. The odds now favored Alexander. This was surely the Achaemenid Empire's most humiliating defeat. After Issus, Darius remained in the east, but Alexander didn't pursue him. He instead marched south, into Syria. There, he came upon the city of Tyre, which we have mentioned in previous episodes as an ancient Phoenician city. It lay just off the coast, on an island, guarded by the Tyrian navy. Remember, that the Phoenicians were experts on the sea. With no way to capture the city by conventional means, Alexander devised a plan. He had his army build a causeway made of stone, out into the sea. From there, he transported his siege equipment out to start attacking the walls of Tyre. The only problem was that the navy was ready, and began to attack the army on the causeway. Alexander countered this by building towers, placing catapults and ballistas inside, to destroy the ships once they came closer. Tyre then sent combustibles to the Macedonians, by ship, and soon the entire causeway was aflame, and the army had to retreat. Discouraged, Alexander knew he needed a navy to take this island. He was in luck. The other Phoenician cities he had just conquered, could provide him quality ships. With an additional gift from the King of Cyprus, Alexander had an army of over 200 warships, and he immediately used them to blockade Tyre. Alexander then built a more protected bridge, which went much further than the first. After finally breaching the walls, Alexander was the first to charge into the city, with his army close behind. The long siege ended quickly. Alexander was furious this siege took a grueling seven months, and sources say he had all the Tyrian men of fighting age slaughtered, and upwards of 30,000 civilians sold into slavery. With the Levant under his belt, Alexander continued south. Next stop was Egypt. Most cities opened their doors to Alexander, but he did encounter resistance at Gaza. The siege didn't last nearly as long, but their fate would be similar to Tyre's. Once Alexander reached Egypt, he portrayed himself as a liberator. 
the general would make the pilgrimage to the Siwa oasis and was crowned pharaoh at Memphis. He restored the Egyptian temples, which the Persians had let fall into disarray, and dedicated new temples to the Egyptian gods. During his brief few months in Egypt, he also founded a new city, one which would become the hub for the Hellenistic era which was to follow. He named it after himself. This magnificent city became Alexandria. After spending the winter in Egypt, Alexander continued his march to the east. Darius didn't want this war any longer, so sent messages to Alexander, offering to give him all the lands west of the Euphrates if he halted his advance. One of Alexander's top generals, Parmenian, had grown weary of the fighting, and wanting to go back home, told Alexander, I would accept, if I were you. To which the Macedonian replied, and if I were you, so would I. And so, the march continued on. Instead of heading straight for Babylon, Alexander took his armies north, into Assyria. It was easier to forage for food along this route, and there were more shaded areas to protect from the heat. They would eventually meet near the town of Gorgamela, meaning the Camel's House, in modern-day northern Iraq. Darius made sure the battle was on a large open plain, so he could take advantage of his large numbers, not like the mistake at Issus. And he would need this space. The upper estimate of his army composition comprised of over 40,000 infantry, 40,000 cavalry, his elite band of 10,000 immortals, 10,000 Greek mercenaries, 2,000 Bactrian cavalry, from modern-day Afghanistan, 1,500 archers, 200 scythe chariots, and 15 war elephants from the east, although they might not have been used. This totals around 120,000 units, while lower estimates are around 52,000. Alexander's army was, as always, smaller than even the Persians' low estimate, with around 31,000 heavy infantry, including his Macedonian phalanx, and hyperspists, 9,000 light infantry, including the disruptive peltastes, and 7,000 cavalry, including his deadly companion cavalry, his full army totaling around 47,000. Once the battle began, it was clear the Persian superior numbers meant nothing. Alexander's army was better armored, and their sarissas, the lengthened pikes used by the phalanx, were enough to encumber the Persians, while Alexander and his cavalry drew away Darius's protection, leaving a gap. They smashed into the weakened Persian center line, and made for Darius and his personal guard. This is when Darius retreated, but Alexander quickly pursued him. But during the pursuit, word came from his army that Parmenian was surrounded by the Persians and needed help. Alexander had a choice to make. Find Darius, or save his general. This was no movie, but it certainly felt like one. Alexander went back, and mopped up the remaining Persian troops, although the Macedonians suffered more casualties than usual, and his dearest friend Hephaestion was badly wounded. This was still a disastrous defeat for the Persians, with estimates of 50 to 120,000 killed, almost their entire army. Alexander then marched into Babylon, triumphant. Persia was finally beaten. Alexander just had one small thing to take care of. Darius was still alive. The Persian king had retreated across the mountains to Ecbatana. After Babylon, Alexander then followed Darius east, taking the administrative capital of Susa, and then the ceremonial capital of Persepolis. The city was sacked and looted, and Greek captives freed. During his five-month stay, a fire broke out from the eastern palace of Xerxes, spreading to the rest of the city, raising it. We don't know if this was set intentionally, as revenge for the burning of the Acropolis in Athens, or if it was merely an accident. Alexander then continued pursuing Darius into Media and Parthia. But before he could capture Darius, the unthinkable, yet quite common for Persia occurred. A Bactrian general, Bessus, assassinated Darius, leaving him for dead, and proclaiming himself the new king, Artaxerxes V. Once Alexander found Darius, he claimed the former king passed the rule of Persia down to him, with his dying breath. 
Alexander then declared Bessus as a usurper. He made sure Darius had a regal burial, and then set out into Central Asia, to find Bessus. Not only because Bessus also claimed the throne, but because Alexander had vowed to keep Darius alive, just long enough for him to publicly abdicate, and give the throne to Alexander, so there would be no pretenders. Bessus was eventually captured by local rulers and given to a Macedonian officer, a man by the name of Ptolemy, who will figure into next episode. Bessus was then sent to Ecbatana and executed. With no more claims to the throne, without a shadow of a doubt, the empire had finally fallen. With the mission completed, Alexander's men hoped it was time to head back home. But for Alexander, this was just the beginning. He planned to walk to the end of the world. Marching through Central Asia, he founded numerous cities, of course all named after himself, along with one named after his dear horse, and then crossed the rough lands that divide the central area from northern India. While there, he met some resistance, not from the locals, but from his own men. The son of Parmenion, the general we previously mentioned, was implicated in a plot to assassinate Alexander. Both him and his father were tortured, and executed. But that was just the start of unrest. From Bactria, Alexander took his first wife, Roxana, a move that was wildly unpopular with his army. They resented his attempts to portray himself as Persian, adopting their traditions and customs. They resented that he was becoming less and less Macedonian, and more and more barbarian. All they wanted, was to go home. Tired, fatigued, and drunk, his army let their concerns be known at a dinner party, in 328 BCE. Cletus, a man of great heroism from the Battle of the Granicus voiced his concerns, speaking for most of the army. In a rage, Alexander jumped up, and hurled a spear through the soldier's heart, killing him instantly. After sobering up, Alexander allegedly felt great sorrow and regret, but his mind was set. India was to fall. At the northern edge of the Indian subcontinent, were the first of the Mahajanapada states. We mentioned these back in Chapter 1 in our video on Ancient India. Alexander soon passed the Persian satrapy of Gandhara, established by Darius I, some 200 years prior. One of the kings there allied himself with Alexander, to fight another nearby king by the name of Porus, ruler of the region near the Hydaspas River, near present-day Punjab in Pakistan. In 328 BCE, Alexander's army, now consisting of Macedonians, Greeks, Persians, and Indians, faced off against King Porus. With the Hydaspas River between them, Alexander's army couldn't cross, as they would be vulnerable, so Alexander formulated a plan. One of his generals, Craterus, would stay with some army in front of Porus's army, while Alexander took more men and crossed the river at another location, while the Indian army was still distracted by Craterus. Then after Alexander flanks the enemy, Craterus and his army would be able to cross over and surround Porus. The plan was a success, and the contingent of Porus's army at the river suffered massive casualties. Porus himself was further back, but once he heard news that the Macedonians had crossed the river, he engaged them in battle. His most powerful weapons were gigantic grey creatures, with what seemed like a fifth limb coming out of their faces. Alexander's horses were afraid of these elephants, but they fought back until the elephants became unruly, and trampled over their own armies. Alexander's troops suffered more casualties here than any engagement with the Persians, but they won nonetheless. Included in these deaths, was his horse, Bucephalus. The same horse who remained with him since his youth. Porus surrendered, and expected execution, but Alexander instead gave him rule over the region. With this win, it surely must have ended here, but Alexander wasn't done. When his army discovered he planned to continue east, into the Ganges, where there were thought to be upwards of 5,000 war elephants waiting for them, they had had enough, and refused to go any further. It is said Alexander stayed in his tent for days, saddened that his journey was about to end. When he emerged, he gave his troops what they wanted. It was time to go home. Instead of going back the way they came, Alexander followed the Indus River south, 
and then west along the coast, to get supplies from the shore. This turned into a long trek of around seven months, losing many soldiers to the harsh desert. Arriving in Susa, he decided to finally be king, instead of just conqueror. In 324 BCE, he held a great feast, where he and his men took on wives. This is where he married Statera, the daughter that Darius had left behind during his retreat at Issus. Hephaestion, his boyhood friend, and possible lover, also married, to another of Darius's daughters. Alexander felt the tensions between Greek and Persian, and attempted to ease them through integration. He also tried to create mixed armies consisting of Macedonians and Persians, although this didn't seem to have worked. There was still a rift between Macedonian and Persian. He planned to solve this by sending his Asian subjects to Europe, and Europeans to Asia, in order to mix and marry. Other plans included subduing the west of Macedonia, taking Carthaginian territory in the West Mediterranean, and most likely end Roman expansion before it could even get started, resulting in a much different future. But none of this would come to pass. Later in 324 BCE, at a party in Ecbatana, Hephaestion suddenly became ill, possibly typhoid, and within seven days, was dead. Alexander was devastated. His demeanor changed permanently, and he became disengaged. He could never get over losing his childhood friend. He never even got the chance. Just a year later, in 323 BCE, at Babylon, Alexander himself came down with a fever, and just 10 days later, was also gone, at the age of 32. An empire, from Macedon to India had just lost its king. Next episode, we find out who succeeded Alexander, and how his great empire crumbled, in just less than 20 years.